Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Energy News Beat podcast. My name is Stu Turley, President and CEO of the Sandstone Group. There is so much going on in the world of energy right now. Where do we get the truth? Do we get the truth from social media? Do we get the truth from industry experts? I happen to have one of them stop by that I happen to trust. I'll tell you what, I've got Dan Romito and he is with Pickering Energy Partners. And I mean, I absolutely love them. They've got great research and he's a managing director over there. Did I get that right? That sounds pretty good. I don't know about the, the trust part. Mrs. Romito might have something to say about that. But <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's that sounds pretty good to me. All right, I'll tell you what, you and I have a little bit of a background with some other folks from the Pickering crew and he was on the podcast not too long ago. Yeah, yeah, Dan Dan loves his podcast. I mean, look, the guy has been doing he'll kill me for saying this. I I, I don't want to say 40 years, but it might be in that that neighborhood. So when it comes wow. to things energy, like clearly Pickering has established themselves as himself, excuse me, as one of the experts in the space. I mean, just he's always on CNBC rightfully so. His analysis is incredibly thoughtful. When it comes to this notion of the energy transition or the energy expansion, you know, to his credit, he's a traditional fossil fuels guy. He he understands that there's a there's an inflection in the marketplace, and you know, one of the things that we pride ourselves at the firm primarily because of him is the data is the data, the math is the math. Regardless of what you want to happen, you have to follow what the objective conclusion from the analysis, from a thoughtful analysis, what does that, what is that telling you? Well, in that respect, it is what it is. Oh, absolutely. And, and when you take a look, I believe Mr. Bobby Tudor too, correct? Yeah. So the way with a little bit of the history lesson, like obviously there's T. Tudor Pickering Hall. When TPH was bought, Dan spun out Pickering Energy Partners. And whereas it was traditionally, you know, formulated for for the shale days the, the way that we think about energy pickering energy partners pep is it, it's basically in all of the above set of considerations now that's not to say we rely entirely on fossil fuels and ignore renewables right uh, but it's certainly not acknowledging that we just go all renewables and leave fossil fuels at the side you know the market it, will evolve the way that it wants and we should figure out what the optimal balance within the energy mix is. It's a little hard to make a iPhone from a windmill. Uh, it's impossible. Yeah. Yeah. Not a little thanks, hard, it's impossible. Thanks for bringing that painful memory up. Isn't that kind of funny? Isn't that what you hear sometimes when people say, let's just go 100% renewables? Yeah, I mean, look, there's there's so much noise and just rhetoric and frankly, just shenanigans in, 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 the, in the market right now. You know, what, what we have fallen, tra- what the public has fallen into the trap of is... We want something so bad to happen right. that we utilize this exercise of just pinpointing data points from here and there to validate what we want to happen. And obviously, it should be the reverse. It's what is the lay of the land? What are the techno- technological right. capabilities? You know, it feels like we've thrown the laws of economics and physics right out the door. And obviously, we shouldn't <laughs> have a conversation for another day. But yeah, I th- you know, I, I there is a learning curve that has to be overcome right. within the general public as to how we get our energy. And in part, I mean, that's that's one of the the, the founding premises of our firm. Right. That, you know, I've done I've done plenty of talks and this has happened enough times where very educated people, you know, I will ask them, and I've said this before on other podcasts, but it, it's it's worth repeating. It's like, well, where does the electricity come from? I had multiple people tell me it's like, oh, electricity. It's like electricity does not come from electricity. So when you have that degree of educated professionals, right, that and they and they hold true to that, like clearly we have we have a misunderstanding problem here. Isn't that, isn't that funny how people just think it comes from the wall, but physics and fiscal responsibility don't matter once it gets into the wall. Yeah, I mean, look, when you really have this debate, it's like we're talking about you know three different things. It's everyone is so focused on generation. What usually falls to the wayside is transmission and distribution you're like look the pop the tenants of power it's let's talk about transmission and distribution for a second right. Forget about generation and they're like wait, wait wait what are you talking about it's like what do you mean and then that's sort of the cue that's the indicator it's like look i'm i'm arguing or debating with someone here who thinks they know 
what's going on. And clearly, respectfully, they, they just don't, right? The, the, the tenants right. of power, particularly, you know, everyone 99% of the time is generation, generation, generation. It doesn't even leave room in, in the public debate. Right. For how are we transmitting power? How are we distributing power? You know, we, we need to figure out, and I think we're doing better as an industry. It's not great, but it's much better than what was five years ago. Just how this stuff actually works and how it impacts you, especially from an economic perspective. Because to your right. point, like the, the 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 way that we've gone about this from a federal level is just throw more money on it, and throwing more money at problems doesn't fix the problems. In fact, it actually no. creates more problems. You know, throwing money at it, bringing that up. I think it was what seven some odd billion dollars, seven point yeah. five nine billion or something like that. And we got sixty school buses from the Harris Biden camp this past year. Yeah. And then we got how many eight seven or eight, maybe nine electric chargers for eight billion dollars. You can't throw money at this. Yeah, there's this quote that I use. So I I mean, just as a little bit more boring background, I'm a University of Chicago guy. And I bring that up because you're beaten over the head with, you know, Milton Friedman, once you step foot on campus, that everything is Milton Friedman, <laughs> Milton Friedman. So clearly, there's an inherent bias built into my thinking. But one of the quotes that he has, that's, you know, that's perfectly appropriate for where we're, what we're currently doing in energy, right. is, you know, one of the great mistakes is to judge policies and programs by their intentions rather than the results, right? That is yes. so true to how we're, we're going about our energy. And to your point, like what's, what's ironic is, you know, energy learned their lesson the hard way from the shale days because capital discipline was thrown oh. right out the window. Like you just took a boatload of money, you put some yep. lighter fluid on it and you just saw it go up in flames. And today, like everything to the credit of the industry, especially on the public side, I mean, it's across the board, but public issuers in particular are just, you know, beaten over the head with this right. mentality. It's capital discipline, capital discipline, capital discipline. So the the irony is, you know, to the cent, it seems like everything is monitored in terms of ROI. And then when we right. talk about federal policy and government policy, particularly relating to energy, it's like, yeah, just throw money on it. And that, that notion of capital discipline is thrown right out the window yet energy is portrayed as the bad guys when we're the ones who are like, okay, well, let's just be smart and efficient right. with how we allocate very finite finite levels of, of capital as opposed to like, yeah, just just throw money at it. It just, it just doesn't make any sense. You know, when you take a look at all your reporting and your skill sets, you, you're, you've got some fantastic slides that you sent over a little bit while we were just chit-chatting mm -hmm. before. And so when we talk about that, let me pull over here one of the slides and we take a look at the CO2 emissions, I mean, yeah. ESG, ESG actually did a great thing because we talked about the fiscal responsibility for EMP operators was right. not all that good. The ESG and the government section, the EMP operators have really taken heart and they're yeah. giving back and they're doing great investments. I love my oil and gas investments. <laughs> I, I, I love my uh, my K1. Yeah. I love, I'm, I'm averaging about 30% on my money on on oil and gas investments, but CO2 emissions have been brought down in the U.S. by the EIA, and no. they said it was because of a reduction in coal plants no. with the increasing of natural gas. Would love me some natural gas plants. Right. And in your chart, the fossil fuel, you've got chart number 10. I'm going to bring that up here and or have the staff fly this in for our podcast listeners. The it is uh, U.S. CO2 emissions per capita have been cut by one third since yep. 1990. And is, do you, was that attributed to mostly reduction in coal plants? What was the issue? No, like this is one of the things that drives me absolutely insane is the, this narrative about <laughs> America's or the United States position in, in the in the emissions landscape at, at, on a global level. And everyone thinks that we're this big, bad culprit. And, you know, everyone's like, well, we emit the most. Well, it's. It's it's that's going to be the case. We are going to emit the right. most from an absolute level because we are the largest economy on the planet. The better way of looking at it, in my opinion, is is to normalize it, right? So when you're looking at the expansion yep. of GDP per capita, which is a great proxy for standard of living, and then you analyze the simultaneous impact on emissions per capita, you right. see that the United States has been decoupling for 40 years, as you pointed out, right? We've expanded. GDP right. per roughly 40% in that time frame. 
And over the same time frame, we reduced emissions per capita about 30%. And you know that, that slide, when I bring that up, I usually lead my presentations with that because CO2 emissions per capita, as you pointed out, have been drastically right. reduced. So, But people not familiar with energy are like, wait, 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 what are, what are you talking about? And it has nothing to do with solely retiring coal plants, right? And, and I would even make the argument that American coal is vastly different than exactly in Australia or Southeast Asia. Like coal is not coal. There's there's a, there's a categorization of it. Oh, I, well said. I, I like it because that is not often talked about. Not yeah, often. Like I would, I would make the argument that, you know, up in, you know, let's call it Northeastern West Virginia, Southeastern Pennsylvania, right. Ohio, even Kentucky, like that, that quality of coal combined with just the general health and safety standards that should be fueling well, third, third world and developing economies because they're not moving off of coal, but they should use ours because it is the cleanest, it's the most efficient, it's the safest. But well, back to your question on, you know, why have we been able to, to, to achieve that reduction in CO2, it's like, you just have to look at a graph, right? You, you look at just the emergence of natural gas, right? Natural gas now makes up a major proportion of our energy mix. And as does nuclear, you know, I, I tell people, you know, I'm, I was born in Illinois. I was, you know, I was raised on the North side of Chicago. And when I tell people from Illinois, like just buddies or whatever, it's like, well, what percentage of the energy mix in Illinois do you think is nuclear? It's like, none. Like you get this <laughs> sarcastic, like a nuclear, which I don't know why there's such, you know, we can talk about right. that, but you know, nuclear makes up anywhere between 20 and 30% of Illinois right. energy mix. So, you know, this, the technological advancement, mostly because of the investment that, fossil fuel and energy companies have right. made over the last 40 years, like that has resulted in very efficient natural gas, very efficient nuclear. I would make the argument that we've inherently placed a, a cap on nuclear just from a regulatory perspective. But yeah, we're, we're getting, we're sunsetting coal. We're not off the reliance of coal. It's getting much better. Oh, no. Yeah. In uh, fact, it's kind of funny. Your slide number 13, global natural gas use up three and a half since yeah. 1975 with one glaring exception. What was the glaring exception? Yeah, the glaring exception is that our friends in, in China don't use natural gas. They love themselves some coal. And that's one of the other things that drives me crazy is like you'll have this snarky argument that China's going renewable because they immediately associate that with with the focus on emissions or environmental stewardship. And it's like, guys, like let's just let's just calm down and take a deep breath and you know go back to to, to reality. China does not care about environmental stewardship. What they care about is being a dominant economic force across the globe. And to right. do that, they need a ridiculous amount of energy. But their their country does not have, let's call it what it is, the blessing that the United States has. They're very reliant on importing energy and they do not want that in place, right? Because you are behest, right. you're beholden to foreign powers. You, you, you are very, you are controlled in, in that respect. So the, the push towards right. renewables is in part to fuel immense demand. So in that respect, it's an energy expansion, right. but also they, they do not want to rely on other countries for their oil imports, right? They, right? they have a good partnership with Russia, but Russia is continuously under sanctions. They probably have burned the bridge. Like we're not gonna give them any quality oil, at least in bulk in the, in the near future. They, they realize that. So in, in, in the push for autonomy and, and economic power, Right. At the global level, like renewables plays into that strategy. They didn't find environmental Jesus and all of a sudden said, let's build us some solar panels. Right. I like the way you said that. And and when you take a look at slide number 14, Mr. Producer, if you can slide in that China is not going renewable and they barely utilize natural gas. That slide is a telltale holy cow Batman to me. Yeah, like I love this stuff. And, you know, this is all public data. This is not Dan's proprietary database that he built right. in his, I'm using, I'm talking about myself in the third person. Like all this stuff is cited. It's all, all right. public. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I mean, to be honest with you, the only reason I got so fixated on energy, you know, I spent almost a decade at NASDAQ. People were talking about the energy transition and they're like, let's get rid of fossil fuels. And, and to me, I'm like, all right, well, that sounds amazing, but let's actually put in the work and let's see if that's a viable right. option. And in doing the work, it's not. And so one of these charts, we've been tracking this 
for quite some time because there is a, a pretty popular narrative on there, excuse me, that says China's going renewable, China's going renewable. And right. that's just not the case. They're increasing, they're expanding their energy mix into solar and wind technology. But them, of all people, understand that there's a shortcoming associated with solar because you know right. you don't necessarily know when the the sun is going to shine you don't nece- you can't necessarily forecast right when the wind is going to blow and they have this 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 vast middle class that they now have to support and this is what we put you know in in the analysis like china's middle class is i think two times larger than the entire population of the united states so they they wow. are not going renewable they just need more or power energy. More power, correct. Right. Wow. And when you we take a look at this brings up a whole nother animal here because I, I get really tired of people saying China's going renewable. Well, I think it's because they're skimming off, they're charging us all this extra for us yeah. for them making all this stuff. And then they're turning around and then they're undercutting their prices internally and using that stuff. And I I mean the amount of waste and bad things that the renewable and solar and wind does to the environment is just makes me air sick i mean the poor old whales are just getting clobbered on the east coast <laughs> i'm not laughing at the whales but yeah i mean look so just just to be perfectly clear like i do think there is a place for wind and solar i just don't think i agree it's dominant energy mix that we should rely upon and it's very it's regionally contingent like i live in florida like we have 320 days of sunshine like that in some ways makes much more sense than like I'm not picking on Pittsburgh, but you know, look, right. they may get 50 days of sunshine, and that's that's probably right. pushing it. But in in any event, not to put on my tinfoil hat and sound like a conspiracy theorist, it's you know the the fossil fuel industry is for the most part, generally speaking, a supply chain that the U.S. dominates. Right? We we dominate that inherent supply chain. Right. When you talk about the renewable supply chain, not only is it like ridiculously complex. It's also incredibly controversial and and somewhat corrupt because what what do you need? You need copper, nickel, lithium, cobalt, graphite. The the vast majority of those uh, rare earth minerals are in China, Indonesia, Russia, Congo, LA, Congo. And, And China is increasingly gaining more control over those governments, namely through pretty bad debt but also just geopolitical influence. So once again, the the cynic in me, but I also think that there's a realistic aspect to it, says, what can China control? Well, right. they can't control what we do for oil and gas domestically. That is completely out of their hands. Right. But they do control the vast majority, if not all, the supply chain associated with wind and solar. And, and oh, by the way, like the, the other thing that drives me nuts is, you know, wind and solar is not green right you're you're essentially trading back end emissions for front end emissions because right. you still need massive diesel machinery to extract the rare earth minerals and then you have to transport them which requires diesel and right. oh by the way you know if, if a solar panel breaks and leaks like you're talking about contamination so once again I'm I I, I don't like the argument I think it's intellectually dishonest when you say well, wind and solar is green. It might be renewable, but it's certainly not green. I I, I don't even like the word renewable with it. <laughs> a, I like wind and solar. And and Dan, I'm in my place up here. I've got four buildings, and in the four buildings, I have a twin propane generator. I have batteries coming into each house. I have mm-hmm. solar on each house, and then I've got a microgrid set up. So I like. But affording it and putting it in are two different things. I mean, it is absolutely not cheap to put in a microgrid <laughs> in for a neighborhood. Well, cost is a, an important consideration, too. If, if you look at developing economies, like one of the things that everyone agrees upon, and, you know, even if they didn't, they'd be laughed out of the room, is what does a developing economy aspire to be? It's a developed right. economy, right? They, they want to be a developed economy. They want the nice things that we, for the most part, take for granted in the United States. And then if you just look at it purely from a mathematical perspective, there is a direct mathematical correlation between GDP per capita and electricity consumption. So in other words, as you become quote unquote richer, 
you're utilizing more electricity. The, the caveat to that is all these developing economies, like for example, India, you know, their, their median household income, I think is like $12,000 USD, right? right? That, that's yes. extreme poverty here in the United States. So affordability becomes a massive consideration. No one is but, going to go out of their way to pay. And so for the time being, at least, what does that mean? They're going to pay for the cheapest available source, which is coal. So you have and, this. Yeah, you know, they've, they've been, sorry. They, I get excited because this yeah, is. I'm a, on a roll here. You are, and you're, you're rolling here. And, and, and India has imported 1,000% more Russian oil since the beginning of the Ukraine war, even outside of sanctions, because yeah. it's cheaper. They're buying it less than the $65 yeah. sanction price. Modi has actually done a great job getting all forms of energy to his people. People, he right. they like him for what he's doing there, and I applaud him yeah. for getting all forms of energy. Yeah, it I mean, what, what do you expect him to do? Like, as a, as a leader of any country, like you have to at least in theory put your citizens <laughs> first. And it right. seems to me like, hey, we're <laughs> sick and tired of living in you know poverty, which is totally reasonable. Like, we need electricity. You know, there's even a stat like I think forty percent of Africa is without electricity. And yes, you know, I, I have this joke. I'm like, if if I turned off, the, once again, I live in Florida, you know, turned off the AC in the middle of August, you know, Mrs. Romito is looking for those divorce papers. She's Googling divorce, right? And like we just, we just, for whatever reason, cannot connect the dots on that. So countries are going to do whatever they're going to do to, to satisfy the demands of their respective citizens and for right. states to say you don't have the right so to take like the moral high ground and say no 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 we have like this environmental or this climate crisis that we have to be mindful of first right. of all we're going to say you guys are the largest economy in the world don't boss us around like get lost the second thing they're going to do is just as you pointed out they're going to go look to someone who's going to see someone will supply it and the argument that we have is because natural gas is the best of both worlds, it's cheap, it's reliable, right. but also from an environmental perspective, it does allow an emissions profile to decrease. Like we should be running point. The United States should be running point on providing natural gas to the world. We have enough of it. Like we don't need all of it. And then when we allow other countries, whether it's Russia or Venezuela or Iran or Iraq to, to provide it, we are essentially funding regimes that inherently go against the standards and the ethics and the morals of the United States. Like you, I, I can't wrap my head around that argument. You, you woke up a big sleeping giant on <laughs> me right here. And, and here, part of the problem is the Biden administration's ban on LNG is oh, nothing God. more than regulatory prosecution of our great natural gas LNG export facilities and capabilities. I wouldn't want to do business with the United States in this current administration. I mean, you, you've you got to look at the long-term contracts of LNG out right. there and the ability of getting that to market out there. Yep. And the greatness of our manufacturing of LNG and the cheapness of it. Yeah, I, I yeah, I just, I mean, once again, we're 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 conflating the 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 or the the Venn diagram here. You know, the, I think the LNG lever is an easy political score to satisfy people who are against right. LNG because it's a fossil fuel, right? That is a that is a quick score, but what that right. does is is it's so foolish over the long term because to your point, it makes it look like we don't know what we're doing. It also upsets countries that are our allies. So they're like, what are you guys doing? But it also like this is a zero sum game in the sense that if they can't get it from us, they're gonna they get, get it get from it. somebody. The Arctic Two, the Russian Arctic Two has has had two shipments go out this week that yeah. are sanctioned LNG. The LNG dark fleet from Russia is increasing. There's five to seven hundred dark fleet folks that are avoiding sanctions in tankers using crude oil around yeah. the world. The dark fleet, everybody said, oh, LNG tankers are so expensive. I've been tracking it. It yeah. is alive. It is real. And they had yeah. two shipments roll out. And it's amazing who's still buying Russian LNG off of the gray market. Well, it's just like, I mean, so the same people that are applauding the LNG in many cases 
are the same people that will argue that like flaring is out of control or, you know, we need <laughs> these environmental <laughs> mitigation things. And look, conceptually, they're correct. Like you, you shouldn't be flaring just for the sake of flaring. Right. There's there's reasons for that. But just pragmatically speaking, there's basically five places on Earth that you really can get natural gas. Right. It's it's the U.S., it's Russia, Iran, China, and then I'd even throw Canada in there, although they're 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 relatively slower. Like Canada aside, if you look at the the, the flaring and the emissions profile of right. Russia, Iran, and China, between those three countries, and I'll throw Venezuela in there just to make my math correct, you're talking about three quarters of flaring on the globe. So, like once again, back to that zero sum, the, the United States for as much that's a lot of Bitcoin gas. miners would be happy if they had that. <laughs> yeah, 100%. Like, you know, for as much natural gas, and I don't have this very this specific number off the top of my head, but the, the U.S. only accounts for less than 7% of all global flaring. Russia, Iran, Iraq, Venezuela combined account for three quarters. So if, right. if you're so damn concerned with environmental stewardship, why would you place production in the hands of those who are responsible for it? I, I that logic, once again, it's like straight out of the no duh files for me. Well, People make that argument. It's like, wait, you're why, now you're open two different things. Why do we allow the Department of Energy to give right whale death certificates to all the windmill folks so they can kill more right whales than are actually in an existence? Yeah, yeah. I mean, look, I'll give I'll give another one. It's talking about you know data. Like I could, once again, I could do this all day. But one of the other stats. That I, I throw out. So like natural gas, like you're, you're talking about five countries are essentially responsible for half the oil right. production on the globe. And, and once again, like oil is not going anywhere only because of the reliance right. that the global economy has on the derivatives of oil. Like once again, right. plastics, refrigeration, roads, asphalt, tire, like the list goes on. Anyway, those five countries, US, Saudi Arabia, Russia, Canada, and Iraq, and sort of the same same idea is like with the exception right. of Canada, like those other countries don't share like the same set of morals and, and social norms. No. But the people who are usually against get rid of oil have a very, in most cases, distinct social agenda, which in Saudi Arabia or Russia or definitely Iraq, you'd be imprisoned for saying that. It, like, in yeah. Pakistan. What, Guys, come on! Like, what? I, I don't understand. <laughs> you know, and you know what? I what gets me, Dan, and 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 I I know that our great EMP operators in the U.S. do such a great job, and you and I mentioned the the ESG. They've taken heart. Yeah, I mean, our guys do great. But here's the energy hypocrisy drives me nuts. Yeah. Why does California import in seventy percent? of the oil that China drills out of the rainforest and yep. they're hypocrisy shutting down our great EMP operators in California and not letting them drill. Yeah. I mean, well, California, generally speaking, should be the model for how not to run anything, right? <laughs> like logic is just not incorporated to any decision that they put in place. Like so we should put a border wall up on this side of California. Is that what you just said? It, I, you know, it's I, I, I California is just perpetual head scratcher. And, and I don't get it. It's just, yeah, like, when we talk, we I've had conversations with, you know, their, their pension fund managers, with their regulators. Right. To be fair, there are people that inherently get it and that are, think about this stuff in a pretty practical and, and reasonable manner, but they're such an outlier. Like, the the the, the, the bulk, the, the, the bulk yeah. of the bell curve is just absolutely lost their mind is entirely more focused on getting likes on Facebook as opposed to like doing the work. But where, where I'm going with this is, you know, we, we think of, we think of like the outliers and we, and we think that that is the norm, right? What California is doing is so detrimental, not necessarily just to the U S energy space, but the global right. energy space. Cause, cause to your point, it's that's, a, that's an outstanding, Dan, I don't mean to give you a compliment, and I am so sorry, <laughs> that's okay. but that is an outstanding way to say that. California is detrimental to the global energy market. I, I've never fra heard it phrased that way and how critically well phrased. Yeah, it's just they they there's there's this problem where we are we are pandering to an echo chamber 
that has made up their mind and and no data point or argument mm -hmm. or debate will will change their mind yet we we continually just try to convince them and, and, and to some respects i i understand or i get it i don't obviously agree with it but you know if, if you look at sort of where the puck is headed and i think this is where you're going if not just just cut me off is the the next sort of economic opportunity much like the dot com right of, of the of the turn of the century that's generative ai right generative ai will inherently change the balance of power in the global economy you know for the next hundred years. And the one thing, and the one thing that people don't realize. So in other words, you, you'll say something like, well, what, what's the next economic prowess that's going to take place? And they're like generative AI. And you're like, do you like it? I love it. I love chat GBT. I love copilot. Awesome. Do you like fossil fuels? They're like, I hate it. Like, you know, we got to get rid of fossil fuels. And it's like, no, no, no. Like you don't understand the amount of electricity that AI is going to yep. require, right. At, at, at a bare minimum, we're going to have to have double the electricity and that's being uber conservative. So people you know, don't understand that AI takes three and four times for a search, the amount of power, the data centers and AI single-handedly killed net zero, any hope yeah. for net zero it's gone. Yeah. We're not where net zero is, is a pipe dream. Like, and, and I, and I'm very clear on this too, is like, I think the pursuit of net zero is something that we should aspire to achieve. I think settling for anything less than absolute net zero is just setting yourself up for failure. I um, like the idea though, Dan, of aspiring for less pollution. Yeah. Because after interviewing Dr. Patrick Moore, the founder of Greenpeace in two different podcasts, he is one cool cat. Oh, I bet. Is, is, sewer, is CO2 actually plant food or is it, you know, good for the environment? Why is the world greener now? And then what gets me is the data that is being manipulated. I also interviewed a bunch of folks on the, the, on the global warming trend right mm -hmm. now is just totally out to lunch. It is being yeah, I mean, manipulated. Yeah. There's so much now that we're solving the world's things, problems. <laughs> yeah. yeah things, like for me, it's like, I, that's not my expertise. And so like, I've heard it both ways. And so I think everyone can agree on that something is going on and yes where i land is like okay that's something it probably is not great so when you have that in place what, what does that mean you have to be much more efficient right we're not in a position where we can eliminate we have the technology where we can expand the, the question is well how do you become more efficient and this goes back to the ai point so you know mit does fascinating work on electricity demand and you know to your point that you brought up earlier is they make they make the the parallel that one data center uses the same amount of electricity as 50,000 homes. Yep. So you think about that and then you're like, well, why do they need all that electricity and it's and it's sort of stating the obvious, but to put a a data point behind it is 40% of that electricity is allocated to just cooling. Right? So once again, you think about these parallels. You know, I I I live in Florida, right? We use air conditioning all the time. And so when you look at daily natural gas electricity in the lower 48, like the chart over the seasons, over the year, it goes, it's it's up, down, up, down, up, right. down. Why is that? It's because in July and August, people crank their AC like it's going out of style. And because natural gas is the best of both worlds, the affordability and the reliability the right. grid becomes inherently more reliant on natural gas, right? More power demand. It's 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 almost mathematical. It is right. mathematical, actually. It's like, all right, we're going to have this surge in demand. What are we doing? All right, natural gas. So if you think about, all right, AI, the vast majority of it goes towards cooling, right? 40%. Right. And then when, tough tom when times get tough, we rely inherently on natural gas. Doesn't it make sense that we should have an energy mix that has more natural gas? And the answer to that is yes, right? If we look at what's going on, excuse me, in Virginia, Virginia has this, this small area outside of DC called Data Center Alley. Data Center Alley by far is the, the greatest concentration and cluster of, of, of data centers. And it's for obvious reasons. It's outside of DC. So like NSA, CIA, like all the government agencies, data, you know, all of the above. Great. Their, their energy mix, <laughs> get ready for this. Like this is the least climatic statement of all time. Their energy mix 
is 60% natural gas, 30% nuclear. The U.S. average energy mix is 40% natural gas and 20% nuclear. So you have all these like, like we're like the Sherlock Holmes of energy mix, right? You have all these, you know, all this evidence that leads to what solves problems, okay? Natural gas. Right. And now you can fit in renewables. But we have zero nuclear, new nuclear plants being built right now. Right. We have small modular, we have three small modular reactors yeah. that are in process right now, but no zero full size ones in process. I, I don't get I, I, I don't I mean, get people, it. You know, Two Mile Island and you know Ch Chernobyl, like I know people saw the HBO special great. Right. You know, the thing about nuclear that drives me crazy is that's a military technology. Like you when if 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 you ever want to impress someone, you introduce them to a nuclear submarine commander. Like you're like, wow, right. what does he do? He's like a nuclear submarine commander. And people right. they they fall in awe of, of the guy and, and rightfully so. But like I'm I've never been in the military. I I'm not gonna pretend that I know a lot about the military, but I will make the crazy statement that the military isn't knowingly going to put a technology on a submarine that is going to hurt their 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 the, the, the people on it. So if the Navy has figured out how to implement nuclear technology, doesn't it make sense that we can scale this? Like almost every technology that we utilize today is has started out with the military, like whether it's the internet, like we we these things start in a military incubator. And then we figured out a way to scale. Your, your these point is level. phenomenal. <laughs> yeah. So it's like the nuclear thing. I just, I don't get. And the fact that it's wrapped in bureaucratic tape is just another I mean, indication. This, there's too much garbage. I mean, going like on. Russia, Russia can't build anything safely. And they've got right. six nuclear icebreakers running around all the time on the Arctic. And they, they're doing fantastic. Yeah. If they, if Russia can do it, <laughs> we ought to be able to do it. Yeah. And like, look, I think, I mean, once again, going back to Milton Friedman, I am, you know, a free market economics guy. You know, I, I think the idealism and sort of the rhetoric will, and I'm being wishful thinking on this one, I think that will eventually crumble and be like, look, you know, we already have 5,000 data centers in the United States. We already have rolling blackouts in, in a lot of states, namely California. There's only so much that people in business will tolerate. Now, I'm going to contradict myself a little bit. Like you're seeing this ma mass exodus out of California and they're coming to Texas. They're coming to Florida and leave. Uh, hello. Uh, yeah. And they all, just leave. All of you folks that are moving and using you home, please leave your voting policies <laughs> at the border. Yeah, do, do not, not go to Florida or Texas. I do not want your voting policies. Thank you. Yeah. One of the funniest things in Florida. So like where I live, I live in Northeast Florida. One of the, mo the one of the funniest things is like like when new people move in and they move all the time, like 800 people a day right. moving to Florida, like the the moms in particular will grill respectfully, but will grill the, the, the newbies and like, why did you move here? And if they and if you ask, why did you move here? And they if they lead with we really like the weather, they're like, nope. We can't hang out. No, no, no. The right answer is I, I left Illinois. I left California. I left Pennsylvania. I left Connecticut. And you're like, okay, we can, we can hang out. We can have drinks. But if they lead with, oh yeah, we really love the weather in Florida. It's like, and, like no, no gift basket for you, dude. No, uh, you're out. That's funny. I, in the words of Larry, the cable guy, that's funny, no matter who you are. Yeah, exactly. I'll tell you what, this is exciting. And Dan, I just really appreciate your time. But at, at Pickering Energy, when you guys take a look at these technologies and stuff, what is important to your customers? What are you seeing coming around the corner? Yeah, I mean, all things now are methane, right? I think, you know, running this full circle, you know, everyone acknowledges, at least in private, you know, even the, the most ardent fossil fuel attractors will say, yeah, we can't really go net zero for the for the reasons that we just laid out. The compromise that we see emerging in the marketplace are investors, regulators, policymakers, and believe it or not, insurers are all converging on this thought that the broader oil and gas space can attain a 0.2% methane intensity. And so for context, you know, we're probably collectively right around, you know, 0.3. Right. Everyone thinks you can move to 0.2. But there is this arms race for technology because 
right now everything is like estimates. It's a lot of spreadsheet math. And part of that compromise, um, at least amongst the reasonable policymakers, right. is that point two has to be point two. So in other words, you have to empirically prove it. You have to quantify it and it has to be validated. It probably moves to a place where it's assured. Yeah. And so whereas two, three years ago, the ability to quantify at scale was just not economically possible, right? It was, you know, that was basically like, you know, you have what would be the equivalent. You 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 have, you know, I don't know, your toilet is, you know, the, the toilet is running and instead of just cutting off the water supply, you burn down the house. Today, there's technologies in place that are very affordable, incredibly efficient. And so we, we see the market, we see the issuer beginning to adopt or implement more technology and more of these capabilities to empirically measure and to quantify and that's sort of been, you know, it's been fascinating because like I said, five years ago, it's like, welcome to the wonderful world of ESG. We like the environment, like social stuff is cool. And then we have a bunch of governance and it was really that. Right. Today, it's like, here's how our emissions are trending. Here's where we're going to be in five years. That's cool. Here's where we see vulnerabilities in the data. And here's what we're doing to, 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 to eliminate those vulnerabilities or to address those vulnerabilities. So it's much more tactical and it's much more nice. operationally focused as opposed to like in the day, it was like kind of telling like a, not a fairy tale, but it was telling a story. It was almost like a market. right. And Boy, the, the new technology that I've seen through satellite imagery and being able to actually track progress is huge, Dan. I'm sure you've got to be able to be happy about that. Yeah. So, I mean, it's, to be honest with you, it's bittersweet. So it brings up another good point. Like you know, the, 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 the compromise has actually, it's, it's a win in my opinion, because it's, it's reasonable, it's practical, it's achievable, right. but for the detractors out there, like the environmental defense fund or climate works or the, you know, there's a variety of them. It's actually a little bit counterproductive because it's act as this lightning rod for fundraising, right? These oh. environmental NGOs utilize this compromise as, as a lightning rod for fundraising. And the vast majority of that fundraising is going towards advanced technologies like satellite, like methane sat, others carbon mapper. Right. So one of the things, and, and maybe in the long run, like I want to be an optimist, maybe in the long run, it'll be a good thing. But the space is increasingly monitored by a group of well-funded, very aggressive, very motivated individuals that would love to see nothing other than the fossil fuel industry go bankrupt. And so it, it is a double-edged wow. sword, like, right? Like these technologies yeah. now are scalable. They're, they're very impressive, but they're also utilized by groups that don't really like us. So it is imperative. Like if, if the PSA, the moral of the story is you have to put yourself in a position to where you can counter, right? Where right. you can counter what they're inevitably going to accuse you of. And, you know, once again, tinfoil hat, Dan, when, when you look at the super emitter program through the revised a EPA rulings, one of the sneaky little tricks is the EPA now has a group of deputized environmental NGOs that essentially do their dirty work. So when people are like, hey, this is going away or it's going to be wiped out. No, no, no. Like the, these environmental NGOs operate outside the purview of your standard regulatory infrastructure. Right. And they're very influential with regulators, policymakers, insurers, investors. We had an insurer, like we were talking to them, you know, we we're just like, what are you seeing? What are you observing? Is And the woman who runs Point for the insurance company you were talking to, super smart. She's like, you know, we get like three or four calls a week from environmental NGOs that are ratting out who they think are egregious offenders. So wow. like big brother, it's creepy, but they they are watching and they are ratting out and they, they definitely have the technology wow. and the food to do so. That's amazing. I'll tell you what. I know. I feel like I, I just told you. Like, sorry, man. And how do people find you there, Dan? Yeah. So the, the best way to find me is either on LinkedIn. It's just Dan Romito or our website, Pickering Energy Partners. Uh, you know, not to give the commercial, but we, we've we written extensively on all these topics. Yep. You know, the, the running joke in the office, which is totally warranted, is I, I, I have the distinct inability to write like a three or four page paper. It's always like these behemoth 20 pagers, but it's because we just load it with data and charts 
it makes class. a difference. You guys yeah, have it got makes, a, it makes a huge difference. You you guys have a great reputation and you've got a great history. And so I, Michael Tanner and I always say great numbers, uh, great management means good numbers. And so you guys <laughs> do, do meet that requirement. No, I appreciate that. Like I said, I mean, the vast majority of our emphasis on the consulting side is, you know, we we are advocates for the space. Like we we are very aggressive because yep. we feel that the math and the physics and the law of economics are on our side. But you know, we are we are very data focused, meaning that we want all our clients to up their game with the data capabilities because it's an easy story to tell, right? It's you know, if if I could you know run a two minute mile, I wouldn't keep it to myself. I'd be bragging but I can oh, run a mile, you know, you know, if you look at back to your point earlier about the aggregated collective emissions profile of the United States, the emissions CO2 per emissions down 30% in 40 years, we've increased GDP per capita, as I said, 40% in the last 40 years. If you look at flaring, you know, we only account for six, six and a half percent of global Those flaring. Are big numbers. Yeah. Like, especially within context too, given our size, you know, no one is going to sacrifice standard of living. Anyone's at like, oh, you know, the, 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 you know, I think there's a movement called the growth of, you know, let's eliminate air conditioning and go down on refrigeration. That's never going to happen. Like at least at scale, it's not going to happen. You might have one or two weirdos here and there that will do it. Right. You get likes on Facebook, by the way, the cynical as that sound, but you're never going to get broader society to do those things. So it becomes an efficiency game. And that means, advancements in technology, the efficient utilization and allocation of capital, thinking about things strategically as opposed to just knee jerk. So all yep. our clients are doing fantastic things. And, you know, we we push them lovingly to, to get that story out in the air because there's a huge narrative that just doesn't have it right. You know, what's fun is that you, you like what you do and I want to have you back because I think I've, I've scratched the surface on about 19 other topics. Oh man, I was so about. nervous like doing this. I'm like, oh God, we're probably going to do 45 minutes to an hour. How do I condense 20 hours of commentary and just well, watch? Let's, let's I would about, love to come back, man. Uh, yeah, let, we've still, I've still got about 19,000 <laughs> questions for you. So let's do it. We we do will, a series. Uh, we're going to table this right here. We'll have all this, the slides that we talked about in the show notes. Right. We'll have your contact information in there as well. And I look forward to visiting with you again. So thank you. Yeah, I appreciate it. This was awesome. Thank you so much. And like I said, looking forward to doing it in the not too distant future. Hey, thanks. Perfect.